Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11. Um, we're going to look at an old chart, which I've added some detail to, just some observations. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, for the time that we have once again this morning to open your word together, uh, to look for guidance and direction in our lives personally and um, what we are to do in this world as far as understanding things and sharing truths with others. We know, Lord, that you are in charge and that you have um, people all over the world who are listening to your voice and are participating in this work of sharing the gospel, a warning message to the world. And we just pray, Lord, that you can help us in our day-to-day -day lives, that you can take care of those that we love, that your angels can watch over them and us as well. And we pray that you can give us wisdom and understanding from your word. May your Holy Spirit be here to interpret it. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So uh, this is a chart from where it talks about even for a time. So we had been um, yesterday go drawing out the line of Rome. Um, but I wanted to go back to this just because I noticed something. I was looking through the charts and um, we know that this even for a time that this is going to be addressing the Battle of Actium uh, to uh, the removal of the capital from Rome to Constantinople. That's the way it's, it's understood primarily. We know Swearingen uh, noticed that we could count it from the Battle of... Um, can't remember what it's called, but it, it, it's going to be, uh, I think, believe 52 BC to 313. You can count 300 and or 58 BC to 313 that you can count um, 360 years. And then we had taken this phrase even for a time and um, we took the word time and we looked at the end of our line, December 25th, 2021, and we found that it would if we counted that word time, um, it would be exactly center of uh, 11.989 and 11.919, right? So that's going to be 11.904, and that's that 30-year period, which uh, then can be divided into 5,479 days. Uh, one is just a cardinal count. The other one's an inclusive count, right? And then we could count from September 11th, 2001, the 6,256 days, the word time, and it would bring us to Jeff's summary of the 391 and a half that was presented in the camp meeting in, in 2018. It's going to be his summary a week after. And um, so we can see that his summary is going, it's going to be October 28th, 2018. But the summary is going to be related to the prophecy of uh, Jose, um, Josiah Litch, Revelation 9, plus also the understanding of November 9th, 2019, so its connection. And then uh, the word even, we found if we counted from the center of that um, 5,704, uh, that would bring us to June 22nd, 2020, when... Uh, the message of Nashville is going to become worldwide news uh, because of the publication the day before in the Tennessee. And, and uh, so we also noticed that, that that's 226 days after November 9th, 2019, which is a reverse of 622 for, we could say, the 22nd day in the sixth month. And, um, and then that's 187 inclusive days to December 25th, 2020, which is 365 days before December 25th, 2021. So that's all in there. I don't know if everybody can see this on their devices clearly. So I'll just zoom in briefly there. I guess I could go like that. That's a little bigger. Okay. So, um, now what I was looking at, so I was, I was thinking about this line because I was thinking about this prophecy and I looked at the 1155 days and this was just, you know, I, I didn't know what it would particularly mean. 
Um, but it's there. So I noticed that 1155 is 77 times 15. And um, I had noticed that um, before that we could take uh, 77 times um, seven, the number of hours in 70 days. And if you multiply that together, so the number of hours in seven days, I mean, seven days times 77 is 12936, which is my home address as a child. So I, I always thought that was interesting that this address that didn't seem to mean anything uh, was connected to uh, the 777 structure symbolically. And then I noticed, well, if we took this 15 times 77 and we subtract 15 from 168, we get 153. So we have this prophetic symbol. Um, so we could say that, in a sense, that that 1155 days symbolizes 153. Um, but I noticed if we multiplied 153 times 77, so I'll just zoom into this a little bit more here in the bottom so it's bigger. So 153 times 77 is 11,781. And, and I thought, well, that's, that's, you know, fairly close to 11,900 days, which is 391 months. We have that in the prophecy of Josiah Litch, um, that the 391 years is 12 times 11,900. Now, technically, it's 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. But I, I noticed if I subtracted uh, 11,781 from 11,900, I get 11,9. So the fact that these are connecting these two 11,9s in the center of this 11,9, um, right, and it also connects to 911, um, I just thought that was interesting that the 1155 days has this connection. It's, it's a little roundabout, but there's a lot of symbols in there uh, just on their own. So Whatever it means, it just means that this structure that we had um, is is has more design in it than we noticed at first glance. Okay, so so that's just a little bit of a departure, but it is related to what we're studying. <clears throat> and now we're gonna go here. Okay, so. <clears throat> We started writing out this line of Rome, and, and the bottom is still just the, the previous line that we had for the line of Greece. Um, so this line of Rome above there is, gonna, is going to relate to that line to some degree. It's going to change a little bit. There will be different symbols there. There might be different dates, um, but we will change that bottom line. So that's not part of the line of Rome. But we do have the parallel still of the Soviet-Afghan war, and this time it's paralleled with the Syrian war. Within the line of Greece, it was paralleled with um, the rise of Alexander the Great. And um, and then we yesterday we put uh, uh, this, these verses on a line, and I probably should really put the verses underneath. So when we deal with Paneum, um, we're dealing with so it's going to be, I guess, technically, um, I mean, it's during the Fifth Syrian War, which is going to be verse, so let's go back here. <clears throat> so it starts in verse 14. So we're going to have this uh, Fifth Syrian War, and um, that's the king of the north against the king of the south. And this is when it gonna, is going to be when Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. Now, and, and just going back here, so I'm going to go back over when we were looking at Greece itself. So when we looked at it here, so we're going to have in verse 13, the Battle of Panea. So it's going to, to reference that. Um, so when we get to, to this here, We've already had the Battle of Paneum in verse 13. And what we had not noticed before is that as you go into these verses, it's going to just give you more detail behind the Battle of Paneum, right? Because when it says in those times, that's going to be the time of the Fifth Syrian War, in which the Battle of Paneum happens. It's already mentioned in verse 13, but now it's just going to give you some more detail, 
right? So it's repeat and enlarge within uh, the prophecy, and very just very common in Hebrew prophecy. So um, it's going to be, let me see here. So during that time, Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision. And we had all of these symbols that tie this to uh, not just 1798, but to 1989. So it's going to tie us to the time of the end. And then when we get to verse 15, so the king of the north shall come. Um, so this is going to be during the Battle of Paneum in that time period and cast up a mount. And take the most fenced cities. Now that's going to be Judea and Sidon, right? And arms of the south um, shall not withstand. That is, they're going to lose the Battle of Paneum. So the Battle of Paneum is in verse 13, but it's also in verse 15. Okay? So it, it, it's in this repeat and enlarge, in the way that we're looking at now, we're dealing with the Battle of Paneum representing November 9th, 1989 which we don't have it representing that when we're looking at Greece because it's the end of Greece, right? But here at the beginning of Rome, Paneum is this battle where uh, the king of the north um, defeats the king of the south. So Raphia is 1798, Paneum is 1989. So we've gone through that. <clears throat> okay, so... So when we looked at the line itself, that's why we put Paneum as uh, the first angel arriving in this line. Okay, so now that means the verse that we're going to place under here. So we're going to have, so we'll just say 11 verse 15, you know, it's Daniel 11. And that means uh, this fifth Syrian war, this is describing, described in 11 verse 14. Okay? Makes sense? And then we have the Battle of Thermopylae in 191. So we, we kind of move that where the fifth Syrian war is, but it, and in a sense, it's part of that. But the Battle of Thermopylae becomes the center of the 62 weeks. And, and so it has all kinds of symbols. You can see the 11-9 symbol in there, and the 9-11 is represented. It puts the 9 in the middle. So you can flip the one to one side, and you can flip it to the other. You get 9-11 or 11-9. Um, and Rome is then, um, this would be the formalization of Rome uh, now beginning to conquer Greece. All right, so, gonna, so it's an important battle against Greece or Syria. And then the next verse, so so this verse, of course, if, if we look at it, it's going to be Daniel 11, verse um, 16. He, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land. That's going to be the next part. So, um, so we're going to have verse uh, 16 being represented at least the way that I see it, because nobody's able to stand against him. That would be the Battle of Thermopylae. And then, so we'll go 16A, and then this one would be 16B. Okay? Any thoughts about this so far? So they're going to enter into the Glorious Land. That's going to be Pompey in 63 BC. So are, are we satisfied that those verses are represented by these waymarks of the period of darkness, the time of the end, which is the arrival of first message, the formalization of the empowerment. Because that's how we interpreted the verses already. That looks logical. Yeah, and 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 it yeah, it, it seems logical and it and it gives us these events and it makes sense that the siege of Jerusalem is uh, the empowerment because this because remember, this line of darkness has to do about the rise of Rome as the power, because it's exalting itself to establish the vision, prophetically, not on its intent. And, and, this, and that's because it's Rome that is going to crucify Christ, cut off the Messiah in the midst of the week, and it's also going to cause the destruction 
of the city and the sanctuary by Rome under Titus. Okay, so that that is the purpose of Rome prophetically. And and this fits in with the whole understanding and context of Daniel 10, 11, and 12 in its connection to Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, right? So I think that we're getting a, a really clear picture of understanding, and, and what I was saying yesterday is that I think that our understanding of of Daniel, its purpose, Daniel chapter 11, has not really been explored. Right? We study it and we try to figure out what the prophecies are about. And, and we can see that them in history. But its whole purpose is sort of, it might be in the back of our minds to some degree, but not consciously. So I think we're pulling this out consciously, becoming aware of it. Uh, any thoughts about that? Because for me, it changes my perspective of how I'm looking at, at what we're doing. So why does it change your perspective? Well, I think because in the past it was just trying to find what happened prophetically, right? Just trying to take these verses and say, okay, what event? Right. But when I look at the purpose of it, I can see why the events are chosen. And that actually helps me interpret the events, right? Interpret the prophecy. Because if I understand the purpose of the prophecy, then there's going to be things that I wouldn't be distracted by. Because remember, it's not giving us the entire history. It's choosing specific events. Um, so if, for instance, we were going to start to see Atticus Epiphanes here, well, we would be losing that whole perspective of what Daniel chapter 11 is about. It's about the rise of Rome to crucify Christ. But there are people who look at this and don't see Christ's crucifixion in verses where we do, right? You know, when it talks about the Prince of the Covenant and things like that, you know, they don't see Christ in there at all, okay? So so to me, it gives that perspective. It also helps in understanding the application for our time as well. Because we know what the historic purpose is to establish the first coming of Christ, and that it's now going to relate symbolically to the second coming of Christ. And particularly, you know, we're making an application within this movement, but that that is just part of a line. It's just a zoom into something that occurs on a bigger line, right? That is the arrival of the second angel's message, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down at 9-11. And so the first coming and the second coming, all this, the, the events connected with this prophecy, right? The fulfillment of, it's been fulfilled in the past. Daniel chapter 11 has been fulfilled in the past. Ellen White says that the history connected with this prophecy will be repeated, right? Old um, controversies will arise and so forth, right? So we know that we can make an application of it in the present time. But how we make that application is really based upon how we understand Daniel chapter 11 in the first place. And, and our understanding of it is now going above just trying to match uh, verses with events. It's actually having a purpose behind those events. Does that help a little bit, Dwight? It helps a bit. I'm. I mean the the point that that we had accepted and have accepted because we understood this was also to be accepted by the pioneers is the combination of history and prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, in many ways, we had gotten away from some of that since 1863 mm -hmm. and i'm saying we as in our um you know our spiritual fathers yeah because you weren't there so. right yeah i i i can't say that yeah you're right <laughs> i'm old but i'm not that old right. so, okay 
So, so, so we, the church, you know, started to go away from understanding history and prophecy as, as a major part. Cause we saw obviously with, um, well, I guess it would be, you know, Prescott, you know, would be where we see this, this whole focus upon Christ devoid from prophecy. You know, the person of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, you know, and that's later, but that, that developed into that. Right. The, the, the first, you know, it's trying to be attractive to the Protestants or, you know, to be a Protestant above Protestants to some degree, but not understanding what a Protestant meant. What was involved, the progressive, because it, the church was not progressing, I guess, is what we, we could right. say. It was it was acting much more like the Catholic Church in the sense it was. Uh, you know, our doctrines were more codified and there's a stultification of spiritual understanding. So, and stultification, just for your information, means that to refers to a state of being in a situation or an action causing one to become stupid, foolish, or unsta- unsound. Right. So, yeah. so that that's really what happened to the movement. And, and stupid in the sense of like sleepy, like in a stupor. Well, right? it's also another way of looking at being drunk on the wine of Babylon. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so I mean, there's obviously what God has been trying to show us through all of our experiences, both individually and as a movement, is that we weren't as far along as we thought we were. We weren't as cutting edge reformers as we believed. We right. weren't spiritually astute as we imagined. We were not better than those that we were condemning. Right? Correct. And, and so this is something that we really um, are being shown is that, you know, we had, we had all these imaginings about what we were going to be, what this movement was going to be, what it was going to accomplish. And, and we haven't accomplished those things, but that's because there was a first work that had to be done and still needs to be done uh, in our individual lives. Because God can't use us fully when we haven't given ourselves fully to him. And so the insight that he is giving us here is not meant to puff up human pride that we're better than others, that we've seen things that no one else has seen. Because that's generally what we did when we saw the 2520 or whatever it was. This was something that lifted us above, in our minds, above others. Right. right? And, and the truths are, are supposed to bring, uh, you know, put the pride of man in the dust. But it wasn't doing that for us. It, it, it kept making us think that we were somehow righteous, you know, that we were somehow better than others. And, and of course, that's not the case. So as we see these things, it's, it's meant to humble us. It's meant to show us our dependence upon God in, in all of the, this understanding. And so the new light that has come as we've gone through Daniel chapter 11, and there's lots of it. I mean, it is establishing old light, right? It's not, it's not erasing what was understood in the past. It's making things clearer, but it's also making our condition clearer to us. And if it isn't, then there's, then, then we're really in trouble. So, so I, I just think that I'm seeing in, in this, what is I've seen Christ in this more clearly, as, as you, we saw with some of the verses that were interpreted to represent, you know, Rome that are actually about Christ, you know, taking the reproach upon himself, even though he had no reproach. I mean, that can't be referring to Rome. It can't be referring to anybody in Rome. It can't be referring to Pompey or anybody like that. It, it definitely is referring to Christ. And so that we can see Christ here in these prophecies and the work that he was doing then is the work that he's doing now. So it, it's, 
It's this final work that's being illustrated. But it, but I, I still think the main thing that I'm trying to say is that there is a purpose here in these events, that they're not just, God didn't just randomly pick arbitrary events. He picked events that are purposeful, that illustrate something. One is they illustrate our history, not just the history then. So they're going to apply to us now. These, these kind of become universal sort of events. Uh, but they do it on many different levels, but they also help us understand the purpose of Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. That, that that's in God's providence, not in Rome's um, ambition. Right. Rome doesn't know where it's exalting of itself is going to lead that that exalting of itself is going to end in the death of the world's redeemer. Right? So Rome has no idea what it's doing. It's not exalting itself to establish the vision in its own mind. It's God who allows Rome to exalt itself. And when Rome exalts itself, this is in God's providence. And so we can see God's hand here. That, that his, his, you know, above all the play and counterplay of human affairs, this rough quotation from uh, the book Education, you know, God sits enthroned. Right? There's all of these events that happen, and not just on an international level, but also in our personal life. God sits enthroned. He orders events. Anything that happens to us comes through God's hand. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize whatever it is, God has allowed it. And he has allowed it for our good because his purposes are going to be worked out. And some of those things can be extremely painful. Some of them are the result, we can say, of our own sin. But God has allowed them because he He wants to uh, remove sin from our lives. And and sometimes we just attribute things to, well, that's Satan trying to hinder God's work. And that may be true. But God has foreseen it. Um, he can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. So no matter what Satan does, you know, God is way ahead of him, right? Satan's playing uh, two-dimensional chess and God's playing 4D chess. Whatever, however you want to look at it. Satan can't defeat God. And so no. I never like to, to attribute things to Satan, things that happen to me. I, I always attribute it that, that whatever has happened, God has allowed, even if it is Satan behind it. But, but I'm usually more focused upon, um, what it is that I have done that has contributed to this situation. Why has God put me in this place? What do I need to learn about myself? Um, when I'm in a difficult situation, what is God trying to show me instead of, you know, Satan? Because when we often attribute things just to Satan and we don't look at ourselves, um, a lot of that just comes from a type of spiritual arrogance. We believe that, you know, we can do no wrong. Anything that bad happens, it's somebody else's fault. Right. We sort of become a type of spiritual victim mentality. So, you know, sure, Satan does things, but but often we've done these things to ourselves. So, so I think you know those are some of the things we're learning as we're going through this. H how active God is in history, you know, to sort of put it in 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 simpler terms, both history on the international level and on the individual level. Okay, so we so we have this here now. We can see that we we can take these verses. Now we have quite a few more verses um, that are going to be addressing this line of Rome. Now the next verse. So let's uh, go to our notes here. Obviously, it's verse seventeen, and and we've had an interpretation of it. Um, 
he pagan Rome. So this is pagan Rome under Julius Caesar. And we, we lined us up with George Bush II to also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. And these are the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar led by Antipater. And we say that that represents Protestants and spiritual formation. So they're, they're coming against this atheistic communism, right? Thus shall he do. That is, we said that's God has appointed by his providence, right? So initially people just say, well, that's Julius Caesar, you know, thus shall he do. But we're saying that, that this is introducing the he is actually God and he shall give him Julius Caesar, the daughter of women, that is Cleopatra, the world, the UN, the dragon power, corrupting her, causing her ruin, the fall of the world. But she shall not stand, neither before him. Now, it says stand on his side. There's nothing there in the Hebrew that would show that. So we just crossed it out. Neither before him. After this shall he, that is Caesar, Turn his face unto the isles. So he's going to, this is the Mediterranean basin, the people, multitude, nations, and tongue, representing the United Nations in our history. And shall take many, uh, but a prince. So we're saying that this prince here is Michael, that's Christ, because in the context here, this is Daniel 10, 11, and 12, right? So we got Christ here. Now, they had a bunch of words in there that didn't exist in the Hebrew because it doesn't say, but a prince for his own behalf, nothing in the Hebrew that would suggest that uh, it just says, but a prince shall cause the reproach um, uh, to cease. Right. And it's not the reproach offered by him. Right. So none of that is in the, in the Hebrew. It's, it's literally just, uh, but, a, but the reproach, uh, uh, but shall, uh, uh, literally it says, um, he shall cause the reproach, that is the prince, to cease, right? So the prince is the one causing this reproach to cease. But he doesn't have his own reproach, right? Christ doesn't have his own reproach. And it says, um, he shall cause it to turn upon himself. Well, this would be a reference to Christ. So Christ is going to take this upon himself. Now, the way that we looked at this when we were going through it is we have these contrasts. We have this ambition of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar wants to become a king, right? That That's, that's what he's pushing for. He wants to become an emperor. He doesn't, right? That's going to be Augustus who becomes the first emperor. But Caesar is seeking that. He's he's full of himself. He has a character that is in complete contrast to Christ's character. Right. And then here to show this. It, it's going to show it's going to represent the cross. So the cross here in this these verses. Um, so we got verse 17 and eight. 18, right? So that's the verses that we're looking at here that we just read, 17 to 18. And, and this is in the time of George Bush. This is when um, we have this, uh, we have 9-11, right? So, so we, we place this at 9-11. But what we're placing at 9-11 is this contrast of these two things. So we have... Um, verses 17 and 18 representing this history. This is the history of 9-11, right? That we're going to, we're going to find out as we, we look at it. So there's this contrast. So I, you know, if we're going to, we're going to place it here, um, what, what this symbolizes, this is going to be Basically, Julius Caesar um, versus, as a comparison, oops. So it's a comparison between those two. It's not a battle between them. 
but it's a comparison between them. So Julius Caesar's all of his ambitions of what he's seeking to do compared to to Christ. But does that make sense that that's going to be the second angel arriving in this line? So it's representing the cross, but it's it's not the, the actual cross itself. Right. It's just comparing these two because we are going to have the cross in this history. So the second angel arriving here in this history is a contrast between the ambitions of Rome and the character of Christ. And they're going to come into conflict with each other at the cross. And and Rome is representing our humanity, our, our natural, you know, tendencies, thinking, understanding, desires, nature, or, or natural nature. It's kind of redundant. But, you know, human nature, fallen human nature. And Christ is representing God's character in contrast to that. And so what's going to follow in these way marks is going to be illustrating that. Does that make sense so far? Thank you. Good point. And, you know, that was um, a difficult study to get to that point to understand uh verse 18 particularly in that way, but also in verse 17 where we see God coming in. And and so we can see all of those things happen at 9-11. We have um, what happens with uh, the Patriot Act, what happens with spiritual formation, all of those things are going to be placed there. So in this line, Uh, that we have in front of us uh, on the bottom, this was the line of Greece. And and so the siege of Jerusalem, you know, by Pompey, we we could put 9-11 here as well, but we also put 9-11 here. So it's going to have, um, you know, some of this here. I'm just going to get rid of this for now, just so it doesn't distract us. So the siege of Jerusalem um, if we look down at the bottom, I, I don't think we would have problems here in understanding the fall of the Soviet Union connected to the Battle of Thermopylae. And we made that connection before with December 25th. And then we have um, uh, the Siege of Jerusalem. Now, what was the date of the Battle of Thermopylae again? We had, wasn't it like... Uh, the first day of the 12th month on the biblical calendar or something like that. I don't know why I didn't. Uh, oh, look. I don't know. Yeah. You, you had a date for it. I can't remember what it was. It was the 29th. Or something else that was the. It was Nissan 29, maybe. No. <clears throat> what was uh, it? Yeah, it may have been Nissan 29. It was the 24th of April of 191 B.C. Yeah, so Nissan 29. Okay. Yeah, I got it here. It's in the 32nd year of Antiochus the third. Year um, 121 in the Macedonian calendar. Um, so I don't, right now I'm, I'm just going to leave the date off there. I don't know if it's, it's got any symbols to it. I was just trying to see if we could connect it here with this date in any way, but I don't think we can. Um, well, 191 connects with 91. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what do we know about the siege of Jer- Jerusalem, Jerus- Jerusalem under Pompey? Okay. Interesting that he was asked to intervene regarding who should inherit the throne of the Hasmonean kingdom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you got Hyrcanus II, or however you say his name, and Aristobulus II. There's a war between them. Well, it's based because of the death of Alexandra Salome. Mm-hmm. Of course, those names mean nothing to us, right? Uh, the queen, Alexandra Salome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, Salome is a name that's part of 
because uh, because this is is connected to uh, basically all that history dealing with uh, Herod the Great and everything like that. I, I just can't remember exactly how this was all connected. Uh, I was wondering if we had any exact dates. Does it look like they give us anything particularly? Don't give us an exact date. And so they were protecting the temple. You know, so one of the things interesting about this, I mean, we have the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that talks about the destruction of the temple. And it's going to place the destruction of the temple after the crucifixion of Christ. Right? So you're going to have the Messiah killed in the midst of the week, cut off in the midst of the week. And then the prince of the people that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and et cetera, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so the destruction of Jerusalem, it doesn't happen under Pompey. Right? It's going to, it's, but it is connected to what it is going to happen I guess 70 plus 62, if you put it together 132 years later, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. You know, Pompey gets into the temple and uh, courts and all that stuff. He actually enters the Holy of Holies. Right. You know, and they always talk about, um, uh, you know, Tychus, you know, desecrating the temple. But, you know, Pompey does as well. I mean, they cleanse it afterwards. But, but you know it. You know what what he does here, this siege of Jerusalem, um, it becomes more typical of what's going to happen than the actual prophecy itself, because he doesn't destroy the temple, and and that's one of the problems people have with uh, trying to apply Daniel to the, a second century BC writer. I mean, it clearly talks about the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, which. You know, no BC uh, counterfeit Daniel, uh, you know, second century BC counterfeit Daniel is going to talk about. I mean, they don't they don't want the temple destroyed. If it was written in connection with uh, Atticus Epiphanes um, and and what was happening with the Maccabean rebellion, uh, it's it's completely out of place. Uh, but it does describe what happens after the Messiah is cut off in the midst of the week. Um, and and I, I just you know mention this because I'm dealing with these people who supposedly believe the Bible, but believe that Daniel wasn't written by Daniel. That was written in the second century BC. Uh, it just it just boggles my mind. But anyway, so so we have this, all of these things happening with Pompey. Okay, so. I don't know if there's anything else I see here that we can we can add to it. We can just say that, you know, it if we're going to put the siege of Jerusalem, does it make sense to connect this to 9-11? That that um here Rome is entering into now in this context, so remember we, we have the UN conquering at 9-11. Is, is Rome itself conquering at 9-11? And, you know, maybe in some ways, I mean, we, you know, we know spiritual formation comes from St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, but I would think the big issue here would more be the Roman law instead of common law, right? The Patriot Act would be um, the primary symbol there. Unless, unless somebody wants to. Well, what is the basis of Roman law? Well, you're guilty until proven innocent. I mean, that's maybe not the basis. That's the thing that we look at about Roman law that differs from common law, where you're innocent until proven guilty. Now, so when we talk about Roman law, of course, it differs at different times, right? I mean, they didn't have a written law that I know of. But they say here... Uh, the basic principle of Roman law, this is one place. All citizens had the right to equal treatment under the law, and a person was considered innocent until proven guilty. The burden of proof rested with the accuser rather than the accused, according to um, Brainly.com. We know under French law, 
the accused is pre presumed guilty until proven innocent. So I guess it depends when you look at Roman law as well. Uh, so the presumption of innocent, innocence, just yes. reading up. The, the point that I'm I'm trying to drive at is we have just as we have addressed in the past. Yeah. Under the law of God, are we innocent until proven guilty, or are 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 we all guilty? Well, I'm, God says we're all guilty. Right. But but you know, uh, in God's court, sentence is not going to be executed against the will of the accused or the guilty person, right? So ultimately, God will execute sentence after everyone agrees to the sentence, right? Okay. Right, because every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Ellen White says everyone will agree to the sentence. Even Satan himself agrees that he is guilty and deserving of what's what's coming but it does not change him or it does not change those who recognize the justness the justice of god's judgments right so i mean so god's god recognizes we're all guilty but he, and he knows we're guilty we're the ones who actually have to find out we're guilty and that what God is going to do to us is completely just. So, I mean, we, we've always said that Roman law is you're guilty till proven innocent. It doesn't appear that that's the case from what I can read here. Um, but this seems maybe to be under the Justinian Code, because that's going to be when Roman law is first written down. So uh, maybe we have to examine this part a little bit more. Now, of course, the Patriot Act does take away all kinds of rights. So, I mean, it does make them guilty, uh, and they have to prove their innocence. So, on that, but, I will agree. Yeah. Now, so, but if we're going to line up, you know, 9-11 with the Siege of Jerusalem, um, so this is not the King of the South conquering the United States. Can we say in some way that Rome conquers the United States? And definitely under Catholic, I mean, I don't know how, how you would describe their law. Um, so we would say, you know, that people should be innocent until proven guilty. Is that something um, that the Catholic Church practices? You know, so. I would have to say no. Yeah. So I'd have to read more on that. And of course, there's always a difference between what a piece of paper says and what a authority does. But in the Patriot Act, we definitely see that, that people are guilty until proven innocent. All the rights to a fair trial, all those things were circumvented. Okay. <clears throat> Now, so if we're going to, uh, now we have 11.919 underneath there, under Julius Caesar versus Christ. Do we bring this into our movement here at this point? Is this the arrival of the second angel in this history? So, so we're going to see in our movement this uh, contrast, let's say. Now, initially we have, a uh, Parminder's movement, right? Parminder's movement has this, this false liberty, right? This wokeism, um, as, you know, sort of the whole issue. They, they try to support the constitution, that the constitution is not a religious document, um, that, uh, the main issue is going to be over the rights of individuals. That is, you know, homosexuality and, um, all these things that come with wokeism uh, become virtues under Parminder's movement. And then we see a reaction within the movement itself. Uh, many of us are older, much more conservative, 
come from a different time, we're boomers, right? And, and a lot of the young people in the movement, they even publicly called us boomers, which I thought was extremely disrespectful of their elders. Um, and, and it's going to be the young people mostly who move over to Parminder's uh, movement, right? So you're going to have a, these crusty old uh, conservatives, uh, you know, looking down on what happened, you know, Parminder's movement. Like, we, we obviously weren't fooled by Parminder because of his political views and tests. <clears throat> but yet we're no better, right? And, and the movement's infected with Parminder's thinking because his thinking is the thinking of human nature. I mean, it may express itself differently, um, you know, for people who are conservatives instead of, you know, woke. But but the reality is we were no better than Parminder. We didn't recognize it. So we thought because we were conservative that we were the good guys. Um, but we turned out to be just as bad, if not worse, right, in the treatment of people within the movement. So I don't know how we would compare, you know, what's happening, Julius Caesar versus Christ. But but I would think that that would relate to that whole 7-7 seven, seven st structure. What happened in this movement from 11-9 to December 25th, 2021, is this contrast between how we are to act based upon uh, God's word or, you know, um, how we were acting and how we, we, in a sense, still are acting, right? Right? Could we agree with that? That there is, um, that that definitely can relate to this movement in this, what we call the second angel. So we could still leave 11, 9, 19 down at the bottom. Okay. I don't know any comments on that, or I mean, because we know eleven nine is nine eleven, right? So they're, they're the same way mark. It's just that originally we we had the second angel arriving at nine eleven. We now understand the second angel arrives at eleven nine. That when it arrives at nine eleven, it's because we are looking at a zoomed in line as we zoom out. That 9-11 becomes these two way marks. But initially we had them at the same way mark. Because in a sense, they are, right? The second angel does arrive at 9-11 in one line. But as we, as we and, and maybe zoom out or zoom in, I'm not really sure to describe how it is. But in, in reality, we, we can see that as far as this movement is concerned, 11.9 becomes the arrival of the second angel's message. However, however we want to describe it. Because our line is a zoom into the arrival of the second angel's message. So maybe zoom out is not the right way to describe it. But because Jeff has a bigger line. So the way that I would explain it is that Jeff kept zooming in and not recognizing he was zooming in because he kept thinking that midnight and the midnight cry, the movement did, that these things are right here. We are thinking, are we, are we past midnight now? Right? But mid what midnight on the line that Jeff had in 2016 is still future. So when he had the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down at 9-11 earlier on, you know, before, before 2016, um, or around in that time, when you had the, the 9 11 both being the empowerment and the arrival of the second angel, he just didn't see that that arrival of the second angel had a future aspect to it. So if we're going to take Jeff's line the way that it should be, you would have. 11.9 as the arrival of the second angel. Midnight is still future. But he had 9.11 as the arrival of the second. And it is in one line. But 
as he looks at his big line, you know, 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law, that 9-11, if, if you look at those events, were zoomed into 9-11. So the lines that he was looking at, the events that he was looking at, were zoom into his bigger line. But now as we look at that zoom in and we expand it out, we see that it's 11.9. Hopefully that makes sense to people. If it doesn't, I'll try to figure out another way to explain it. But Jeff just thought we were further along the line than we were because he was looking at events that are actually a zoom in to 9.11. So when we zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, November 9th, 2019 becomes the arrival of the second angel. So Jeff was zooming in, but not realizing it. Okay. So maybe that, that's a better explanation. Okay. So when we look at the next verses, then he, Julius Caesar, Bush the second, shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. But he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So we have Caesar's assassination on March 15, 44 BC. Then shall stand up in his Caesar's, Bush II's estate, a raiser of taxes, that is Caesar Augustus. And he's going to reign from 27 BC to 14 AD. So it's going to be under Caesar Augustus that Christ is going to be born. Right. So, so we can see here, whatever we're putting at the second angel formalized, it's now going to be Caesar Augustus. Now there's a few verses here, of course, because this is up to from 19 to 22. It's going to be talking about this um, Caesar Augustus in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. He's going to die peacefully in 1480. And his Augustus's estate shall stand up a vile person. So this is going to be Tiberius. And it's going to be Tiberius who symbolizes Trump in this line. Um, uh, he's going to give it to Tiberius. He's going to stand up. Right, take over um, this kingdom to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come peacefully, come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries or false flattery or deceit from the Roman Senate. And with the arms of a flood shall they, the alleged seditionists is what we had. We didn't actually finish this line completely. Be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant, the crucifixion of Christ in 31 A.D which symbolizes July 18, 2020. So, so we would have to say that we have Julius Caesar and then we have Tiberius. Under Tiberius, well, we have Augustus, pardon me. So we have Julius Caesar, Augustus, Christ is going to be born. And then we're going to have Tiberius, Christ is going to be crucified. Okay. And then what's going to happen in Daniel is it's going to, I should switch the screens. It's going to backtrack, right? So Daniel chapter 11, when they get to verse 23, they're going to address the whole thing of the Jewish league. And again, we haven't, we haven't figured this out completely. So we have to try to understand this. And that's why we're drawing this out on the line. But the things that we have to figure out here is exactly what this historic application means in the context of our history. So, so we know we're going to have Christ crucified under the reign of Tiberius. But then it's going to go back, right? And it's going to go back to the Jewish league because it's going to address the destruction of Jerusalem. So the reason why Jerusalem is destroyed has to do with this Jewish Roman league, right? So it, it, it's sort of a repeat and enlarge. It's going to sum up why we're at the end of that line. Okay, and, and the point of why it's destroyed by this Jewish Roman League is what? Well, because it allows Rome, Rome to come in. It allows Rome to dominate. There's lots of reasons. Okay, I mean, but isn't it... Yeah, okay, go on. You have an idea. Didn't 
Moses, after being told by our Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. make it clear to the children of Israel that they were not to enter into league with any of the nations around them. Mm -hmm. So were the children of Israel disobeying the very word of God when they sought to enter into league with Rome? Yeah. Yeah, and we already connected that back to the first league that they made uh, with the Rechabites. Correct. Right, so that that had a period of um, what was it, fifteen? Um, I'm trying, how many years was it? Yeah, so it's going to be yeah, thirteen hundred and thirty-five years from the league with they made with the Gibeonites. Okay, I said Rechabites, but the Gibeonites. Right. And there's the three day symbol involved with it. And then from 161 to 158 is three years. So they make the league in 161. It goes into effect in 158. And it's all connected to the 666 years. Right. So from 1493 to 161 BC is two times 666. Then you have the three years. Then you have the 666 to 508. And then you have from 508 to 1840, you have 666 times two. And then you have the three years uh, to 1843 when the second angel arrives at the end of that. And that's 1335 years, obviously, from 508. Right. So that was this chart here that uh, Stephen made. Right. So that was, you know, connecting all of this past history. So it was this initial thing that we noticed regarding the 1335. So we have... 666 times two, and then the three years to make the 1335. So, but this Roman league here is going to lead, lead to the destruction of Jerusalem. Right? That's the, that's the issue. So when we, when we get to that section, so we're going to first have Augustus, then we're going to have, um, uh, Tiberius. So when Augustus Christ is born under Tiberius, Christ is crucified. And then you're going to have this discussion of, of the Jewish league that's going to end with the destruction of the temple and the diaspora. Or diaspora. How do you say that? Yeah, the, the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of the temple. The point that I am, I'm looking at, and I know we've covered this in the past. Mm -hmm. The league with Rome was just as much of a covenant as what we see occurring in the book of Ezra. So throughout this time period, you have the children of Israel entering into covenants that they should not enter into. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> have we seen this situation played out in a spiritual sense since 1856? Um, well, I, I don't think we need to, I don't think that, I mean, I, I agree, but I don't think it's relevant here. Again, right? so, it would be adding to our understanding of what's going on. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I know you, you like to bring it up, but, you know, and, and I don't know if 1856, I mean, when did they when did they first meet? Was it in 1856 that they meet with the evangelicals? We're talking about the evangelical uh, Adventist conferences. No, no, you're, you're there, there you're looking at 1951. I'm saying 1856. Oh, oh, 1856. So what are you saying about 1856 then? What What's the league there? I was thinking 1950s, but you're right. saying 80. Oh, Okay, so what's in 1856? When they began to reject the seven times. Oh, 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 okay. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I understand that Higher Medicine does those seven articles on the seven times. But 
and and there's obviously the symbolism from 1856 to 1863. But I, I don't know if I would mark that as league. It, it, I mean, maybe 1863 when they reject the seven times. But and it's not as simple as that. I mean, it wasn't like they had the seven times and they decided together as a church that we don't accept it. Because James White still accepted the seven times. Right. right? Ellen White still accepted it. Right. We have Uriah Smith who doesn't accept it. Correct. James White isn't going to accept um, Hiram Edson's new interpretation of the seven times. Right. So he, he doesn't think that that is is going to make sense, obviously, at the point that they don't. I mean, we don't know why the articles aren't finished. It could be that Hiram Edson just didn't have time to finish them. So we don't know what the reception was of his uh, Times of the Gentiles. So I don't know if I could place the rejection of the seven times in 1856. What was presented was an opportunity to examine the seven times anew, and, and obviously they didn't follow through on it. Right. And, and in 1863, the main issue for me is the 1863 chart, in which it's no longer uh, a Leviticus 26 chart. It doesn't start with the year. There's no timeline. Even right. though the split does give us 677 B.C., right? So Uriah Smith's book that goes along with it, right, noted, write it on a table, noted in a book, that book does have 677 BC for the start of Babylon. Right. right. So it, it has the captivity of Manasseh clearly marked as 677 BC for those who say that, you know, the 2520 was rejected in 1863. It's the, just the chart itself doesn't have it, but it's still implied. And then also the chart has hidden on it the whole prophetic mirror and the 2520. So, so I don't really accept the idea that the 1863 chart, I mean, it is an image of jealousy, right? But not intentionally, right? It's that is people aren't really aware of what's happening. So there is this intrusion of Protestant ideas into Adventism even before 1863. But this is going to just, it's just more that there's a seed there that's going to be manifest later on, right? So you're trying to say if we take 1856 and we compare it to the league, I don't know if I would take 1856. I would have to put, I'd have to give another date in Adventist history to connect to the league. I don't think 1856 would be the year. 1863 would be the earliest that I would go with that league as, as a parallel. The seeds were being planted in 1856. They came to fruition in 1863. That's the way yeah, I'm... But were, yeah, well, I'm saying they were planted before. Then. That's what I'm saying. 1856 doesn't stand out to me as, as, you know, other than we just have the symbol of the seven articles on the seven times by Aaron and Edson. But I don't see anything particularly where you know, Protestant interpretation is being brought in at that time. All right. Right. That's that's all I'm saying. But anyway, it, it's sort of all an aside to what we're looking at here. The main point is that we have this Jewish league is going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. And uh, so when we look at verses 23 to 24, that's going to bring us to the end of that that line of prophecy of pagan Rome, right? Then yeah. what we're going to have is we, we obviously have pagan Rome still there, right, in verses 25, because you're going to have this whole history dealing with Octavian and so forth. And, and I think that this has to be a different line. Like, I don't think we can fit it into this line. That is... This is going to bring us to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to give us um, this chart here, which we looked at the beginning um, of the study today. It's going to give us this chart that's going to bring us to 
uh, Rome moving, so the city of Rome moving to Constantinople, uh, you know, after the destruction of Jerusalem. So, so that the end of that strongholds, they're not going to have the strongholds being Rome anymore. But then when you go at, um, In, in this history here, they're going to go back to this history now dealing with Augustus, which is going to be the start of this line. So, so you know, it's it's. It, I don't know how we're going to draw that out. It's like we have these little repeats and enlarges that are zoomed into some of these waymarks, but there's a whole bunch of history here when we go back to Augustus, that's going to lead to, because once you move the capital from Rome to Constantinople, even though, you know, the donation of Constantine is a fake document. Um, the idea here, though, is that Rome now is going to be controlled by the papacy, right? Whether Constantine actually gives that power or not, it, it's what ends up happening. The papacy moves in, and uh, so that's going to bring us to that history. And then when we get to verse 30, we're going to deal with the fall of Rome and the rise of the papacy. Right? Right. So so in trying to draw this line out, um, I'm just saying that it, it, it's fairly complex, but there's these repeat and enlarges. So, so this whole, from verse 24 or 23, pardon me, all the way to verse 29 is addressing um, what happens at the beginning of this line and and the end of this line, right? So it's really addressing this structure, you know. So all of this last part, you know, everything going back, dealing with the league, leading to the destruction of Jerusalem, Right? So it's it's focused upon this um, this part here, uh, the lead, leading to the destruction of Jerusalem. That's part of the prophecy of Daniel chapter nine. Right, you're going to have the the cross. Um, yeah, it's here the, the lead verse twenty three. Right, so that's that's so you're going to have the cross. You're going to have um, you know you're going to have the birth of Christ under uh, Augustus. You're going to have the death of Christ under Tiberius. And then they're going to go back, refer to this Roman League, and then to the destruction of Jerusalem under Titus. Um, but they're also going to tie you into then back to Roman history. So so I guess what, what you see are two things happen. Um, you see the prophecies relating to Christ. and then. What happens to Rome, because Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, but Rome is going to fall. And when Rome falls, pagan Rome falls, the papacy moves in to take its place. The man of sin, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we can see all of this history here. And then we're going to have to take this and try to say, well, how, and, and we had to struggle with this. Um, you know, we, we didn't finish off these. You don't see a lot of red here. We don't have the present truth applications placed in here because they were very complex lines and we, we weren't sure what we would do with these. So, so when we finally get up to, you know, verse 30, so we get all the way up to verse 29. So we got that. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. There's a bunch of stuff in here, and we have nothing in our present truth application of it. So these must be separate lines that are zoomed into specific way marks on this line that we're drawing, right? So we're drawing a line here, and, and these verses are going to go back and repeat some of this history. And so we're going to have to have other lines, and I don't see how we can avoid it. Like, we actually have to address each of these different lines, and we have to decide when we look at, at the Jewish League, what way mark are we zooming into? 
when we address um, the history of Octavian becoming Augustus and the Battle of Actium and all those things, what lot, what way mark are we zooming into, and why are we zooming into it? Why why is that information there? Why is that detail clearly marked out in Scripture? You, and you understand what I'm saying. So we're going to have Julius Caesar, we're going to have Augustus, we're going to have Tiberius, and we're going to have Titus. These are the ones that are going to be addressed in these lines. But in each of those lines, we're going to have a repeat and enlarge within within these verses. Does, does that make sense? So here we're going to have Augustus. You know, and I would think that, uh, you know, the zoom in when we deal with Octavian and everything, that's going to be a zoom in to Augustus. Right. Uh, when we have Tiberius, there's some verses that are going to address that. And then we're going to have, um, we're going to have, I believe here, the third angel arriving is going to be Titus. So we're going to have the birth of Christ in 4 BC, uh, the death of Christ in 31, and then the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. Those, those are going to be there. But then we're going to have a line zoomed into the second angel formalized. And we have to figure out why is Augustus the formalization of the second angel. That's pretty clear. Um, why Tiberius is the empowerment. That's going to be the cross. And then the arrival of the third angel is the destruction of Jerusalem. That makes perfect sense. That symbolizes the Sunday law, right, in arriving. Okay. So and any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not right now. Okay. okay, well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study this morning, uh, for the way that you speak to us and the insights that you give us into your word and into our own lives. We pray for forgiveness for our sins, and that we can learn to depend upon you more fully. And... Um, we just pray that we can come together again, that we can study these things and that we can have clear minds and clear understanding and that you can continue to show us wonderful things out of your law. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.